I made a series of videos a while back about the patriarchy and about white privilege. And a lot of my subscribers or viewers said, I always thought you were a liberal, Andy. Um, now you're starting to talk like the alt-right. Really, I thought that was rather interesting because it, it sort of puts things in a binary, right? It says you're either with us or you're against us. So if you say anything that resembles what they say, uh, you're one of them. Um, you're one of the bad people, I suppose. Um, again, that's the polarized times that we live in, right? Um, you, uh, you take a side, you inject a strong sense of morality and ethics into it, even if it's a very carefully worked out system, that leaves you with a coherent position, but it also kind of forces anyone who doesn't agree with you on a position that you've taken and hold quite strongly. It forces someone who doesn't agree with you into a situation of moral and ethical opposition. Um, I was talking about white privilege and how I say just using that term is racist. And I, I stick to that. I, of course it's racist. You're generalizing not on what someone has done, but from what they are. You're deliberately violating um, Dr. King's American Dream speech, where people will not be judged by the color of the skin, their skin, but by the contents of their character type thing. Well, when you talk about white privilege, you're judging people by the color of their skin. It's that simple. Um, you're racializing people, whether they want to be racialized or not. Uh, I don't really identify as a white person anymore very much. Um, and it's a strange situation to sort of... I haven't switched my racial identity. I just don't think of myself that much as a Caucasian anymore. I don't suddenly think of myself, say, as a member of the Asian community, because my wife is Asian, and a lot of her friends are Asians, and my in-laws are Asians, and I'm closer to them than I am with my own family. It doesn't mean that I've suddenly become an Asian person. It's just, it just means that I've kind of abandoned the idea of being white. But if, you know, people who use the term white privilege will say that you, lucky you, being white, you have the option to do that. If you were black or Asian, you wouldn't have that option. And, well, okay, I, that's all very well, but is this any circumstance I did anything about? Well, it doesn't matter if you did anything about it. It's just the reality of the situation. Fine, then. If we're going to racialize people, then we're going to racialize people. So shall we talk about the um, Aboriginal Canadian crime and incarceration rate. Wait a minute, you can't do that. Well, why not? Because you're doing that to me, right? You're saying that I don't have to worry about all these things, or white people in general have certain attributes which set them apart from other people, um, which, you know, it's you'd have to be blind not to talk about that. Like, you don't know what it feels like to be called a nigger. You know, you don't know what it feels like to, um, you know, to uh, come home and, you know, have your kid come home from school and say, I got called a bleepity bleep. So it, in a sense, that is a privilege. Yes. Okay. Um, if you want to look at it that way, if you want to racialize me that way, that's fine. But I get to racialize you in return. Now, I'm not going to do that, of course, but I'm going to point out the fact that the crass inconsistency of what you're saying. You get to take the things about my appearance that make me kind of look bad and use them against me. Can I do that to you? No, of course I can't do that. And I, to be honest, I don't want to do it. Um, but I would like to point that out to people. Um, what is it that makes that dynamic possible? Why, why is it that, you know, we can talk about white privilege and we can't talk about, say, African-American privilege when you're talking about things like affirmative action. Um, why, what, what, what's the difference there? Ah, okay, now we're getting to the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter here is victimhood. We have determined that anyone who is not Caucasian is more or less a victim. Therefore, 
in order to correct this imbalance, things must take place, right? Um, you have to remember what, you know, that, that white privilege and, say, black privilege, if we were to speak of such things, are fundamentally different. If I intervene in the social order to advance the interests of white people, uh, that's racism of a negative sort. Um, and if I intervene in the social order to sort of handicap non-white people, that's even worse, of course. <clears throat> but if we do the reverse, if I intervene in the social order to advance African-American interests or um, handicap uh, Caucasian people, um, that's not racism because I'm correcting a pre-existing victim-perpetrator dynamic, right? Um, we say that, say, historically, uh, African-Americans, Irish Catholics, Jews, whatever, were historically persecuted, victimized by the larger society. We have, we have to set the stage before we even begin to talk about anything. Um, and once we have, have established that, then we can start moving into how we apply that to real life, how we apply that, say, in terms of policy or even mindset. Um, again, I spoke yesterday about the victim mentality among Irish Catholics. They did that to us. Therefore, they are in a deficit. We don't have to do anything. It doesn't matter that we're drunk and loud, so there's an awful lot of us who are violent, and, um, you know, a lot of us uh, didn't really make much of ourselves <laughs> in, uh, in life. Um, that sort of thing. Um, because really, well, how, what do you expect with the horrible things that have happened to us? This is very common to this day in the Irish Catholic community. It's on its way out, of course. I keep saying this. But it, you'll you, you get to know the Irish Catholic communities in large North American cities, and you'll still see that mentality is there. Um, whatever we do is a result of the horrible things that have happened to us in the past. Whatever they do is evidence that they're evil type thing. It's an attitude that I really, really have problems with. That's the victim mindset. I am not saying that if I go out and get on a bus and somebody picks my pocket, I am not a victim of petty theft. I'm not saying that if a woman is walking down the street and is suddenly um, has a man, a man thrusts his hand underneath her shirt, that she is not a victim of sexual assault. I'm not saying that at all in those particular cases. What I'm saying is before you even set the stage for any kind of discussion of anything, what is implied at the very beginning, and it's not just implied on in terms of what someone has done. It's implied based on what someone is. You see the difference. Um, again, we want to talk about feminism. Okay, now we have two, the, the feminist discourse when in its uglier manifestations is often one between um, groups of males and groups of females, each one ferociously attacking the other one for victimizing it. Um, take the most intractable conflicts in the world. Take the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, I've gone on the record saying I completely sympathize with both sides. Well, how can you do that? It's quite clear that uh, side A is the victim and side B is the perpetrator. Is it that clear? Or, is, or, or, or do you want it to be clear? Or do I want it to be clear? Um, finger pointing means I'm off the hook, right? When I say I'm the victim, I don't really have to do anything. It's the other guy that has to do something. They're the one who is who has the incumbency of actually um, fixing their ways, or or if they have to do something, or I have they have to give me something, or they have to give up something in order to rectify the balance. Why? Because they're the victim. It goes back to that um, non-aggression principle 
which is so horribly abused. Um, people say, um, you know, your right to swing your fist ends at my nose. Okay, that's kind of encapsulates it, right? Um, it says that if I'm not victimizing you, I can do anything I want. And if you're not victimizing me, you can do anything you want. But how do you not victimize somebody? Hmm? How do you not do that? It's almost impossible. Um, anything that I do can be construed as an attack or as something of a harm visited against somebody else. And again, that's the beauty of in Mendham and Company. Um, everything is harmful. Everything is an attack on others. Uh, everything is victimization of everybody. Uh, in a fundamental sense. Now, that's kind of setting the stage, and that's kind of dealing with it, as it were, from the outside. You're looking at society, and you're trying to analyze what is going on as an outside observer. How about as an internal observer, okay? How about somebody who is dealing with a victim-slash-perp um, mentality? Oppressed-slash-oppressor mentality, that kind of thing. Um... And again, this is not a left-right thing. Not in the least. Um, I'm always saying nasty things about the angry white male. And if you ask me, the angry white male um, is pretty much the ultimate victim these days. And generally, they're conservatives. In fact, I'd probably say they are overwhelmingly conservative. Uh, you know, the movie um, uh, Gran Torino or falling down, or these sorts of things, the stereotypical male baseball hat wearing Trump voter type thing. Uh, that's a victim for you. <laughs> he's convinced that he's pulling society uh, single-handedly. He's pulling all of society's weight single-handedly, and everybody else is taking advantage of him, and calling him a racist and a redneck and all this sort of thing, and um, hating him for what he is, and God help him if he hates them for what they are, and all this sort of thing. So to hell with you all, I'm voting for Trump. <laughs> um, same dynamic that got Nixon elected. <clears throat> That's a victim, too. Uh, so be careful of this idea that cultures of victimhood are only on the left. They aren't. <laughs> Right-wing victimhood is just as strong. And again, when you have two sides vying for the type, for the title of victim, then things get really ferocious. <clears throat> um, again, Israel Palestine. <laughs> you want to you want to demonstrate that you're the most powerful person in the world. Um, you decide who is the victim and who is the perpetrator in any given conflict, any given dynamic. That is power. Um, again, because we have this non-aggression principle or golden rule burned into our brains. Um, we can't see the world any other way. <clears throat> but as I say, go internally. From the, your own thinking, what makes you fundamentally a victim? Are you actually, are you sincere? See, there's another aspect to it. When, not, when I say, say, for example, I'm a victim, am I sincere or am I, am I just doing that to get privileges. Um, you know, the, this is what the angry white male sort of blames minority groups for. You whine and whine and whine about how your particular group has been oppressed by my particular group. And what that inevitably means is money and, you know, this sort of thing. You want more of my money, don't you? Uh, you want to diss me even more, don't you? That's what really, that's what this is all about, right? You know, that's, that's victimhood. Um, you're all out to get me. You're all out to harm me. You're all out to take advantage of me. You're all out to screw me. You know, and, and again, left, right, this is evenly distributed. This sense of, you're all out to, to you people, you bad perpetrators are out to harm me, this poor victim who is just trying to mind his or her own business. Um, and another thing is, once you've established that you are a victim, you get to be nasty to other people. Um, because you're, because these other people are perpetrators. 
Uh, I've often said that the victim mindset ultimately is what led to Auschwitz. Because what we have is, we have a society that says that it, it itself is fundamentally a victim, German society, post-Treaty of Versailles. And who has done this to us? Ah, the Jews. Well, they are the perpetrators, so once we deal with them, um, we will much, we'll have a much better society. It goes back to um, um, that uh, video I made a while back where um, a young woman said, um, white males are the worst people in the world. Okay, but I guess you could make a coherent case for that if you want, if you want to arrange facts in that way. But the Germans did something similar in the Nazi era. We said, you know, <laughs> we, they said, um, Jews are the worst people in the world. So we herd them into these camps, and then we'll have a better society once we deal with these people, because they are the perpetrators and we are the victims, right? Um, that was the thinking that went into it. Auschwitz had Arbeit macht frei written on the doorway. Work will make you free. You know, that's the rubbish that they, meaningless title that they put over the gate as people walked in to be worked to death and then gassed and cremated. <clears throat> they may as well have put deposit perpetrators here instead of that. Because ultimately the theory behind these concentration camps is to remove the bad people from society because they infect society in general. So if we take all the bad people, remove them from society and segregate them and put them away from society, then society itself is now better off in a general sense because we've removed the perpetrators from society so they can no longer attack the victims. <clears throat> Nazism is very, very much the cult of the victim. The German people, the good people, the wonderful people were the victims of everybody. They were the victims of the Jews. They were the victims of the Bolsheviks. They were the victims of the Western Allies, they were victims of French manipulation, they were the victims of British and American capitalism, they were uh, the victims of uh, aggression, of first the, uh, the, the ruthless czars of Russia, you know, this sort of thing. Um, it's just non-stop the, the, the BS that the German people have had to put up with, and we're not putting up with this anymore. See how that rhetoric works, eh? You know, you, you just sort of list off the a long list of the horrible things that others have done to you. And slowly but surely, you start to see the world that way. You start to see the world fundamentally as a victim, as somebody who um, is in a moral or ethical surplus in the world because you've never harmed anyone, but everyone has harmed you. Um, now, <laughs> ask a non-German about that. They may have a different opinion on who is victimizing whom, especially, I would assume, a Jew. They would sort of say, you're saying that I'm victimizing you, are you? Are you out of your mind? Like, look at, look at what's going on here in your society. I'm asleep in my bed, and suddenly there are people pounding on my door, hauling me out into the street, bundling me into the back of a, of a, cattle truck and carting me off to a concentration camp along with my wife, children, and aged mother. And yet, you're my victim, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what, that's what your stereotypical German of the Nazi era does think. <laughs> um, that's a horrifying thought, isn't it? Not only is, you know, is this Nazi sort of seduced German, maybe not actually a Nazi him or herself, or may not have started out that way, but slowly over time, from a diet of propaganda and from half-truths and everything, and um, ignorance, maybe you really don't know anything about Jews at all. But, so you have to take whatever somebody tells you. Oh yeah, I guess they do do all these horrible things. Wow, they're bad people, aren't they? Um, you know, you get a discourse that sort of singles people out for particular abuse, and uh, pretty soon they're perpetrators and you can do anything you like to them, right? Now, I'm not saying that that's the way it is in the United States, contrary to what all the angry white males say. Um, it's not. 
But, you know, there are little tiny elements of it in there. Like when Nora Loretto says angry, or white males are the worst people in the world. Or even if you just sort of say, on a continuum, who's caused the most harm in the world? You ask that question. Well, <laughs> ask an Irish Catholic in North America or someone who grew up in that community, say, in the 1950s. What group has caused the most harm in the world? Well, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males, of course. It's bloody obvious that that's who's done it. All right, well, that's all very well, but <laughs> uh, it's kind of a half-truth, really. <laughs> Um, it's a lot more complex than that, and reality is rarely so convenient as to neatly package human relations into victims and perpetrators. And people don't like it if they think that they're a victim and you're trying to make them into a perpetrator. You want to really infuriate somebody um, who is sort of an activist of some sort, like, I don't know, an activist in terms of identity politics. They're an activist for their community, and yet you try and tell them that they're a perpetrator, that their group are perpetrators, not victims. You want to really infuriate somebody? Try that. I've done it before. I've done it to my fellow Irish Catholics. And I was physically assaulted for it. <laughs> um, uh, just the, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories. It wasn't a pleasant experience, but I was in a, an IRA bar in downtown Toronto, Canada, a long time ago, 30 plus years ago. I was drunk. Everybody at the bar was drunk, of course, and they, we just sang all these songs all night. And at the end of the night, the hat goes around for our lads. You know, let's have some money for whatever non-governmental organization is supporting the cause of Irish Catholic nationalism. And silly me, when the hat came in front of me, drunk, I went, Big show of, no, 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 you're not giving me, you're, you're not, I'm not getting it, giving you any money. You know, to hell with you. I don't believe in that garbage. I'll, uh, I'll sing the songs and I'll, you know, roust her like everybody else, but when you come, come to that garbage, leave me out of it. No. Okay. Very short time later, I'm out in the alley, emptying my bladder against the wall. A very Irish Catholic thing to do on a Saturday night, I must say. The washrooms get filled up. Okay, well, <laughs> go out in the alley. Um, somebody walked up behind me and uh, grabbed me by the back of the head and pushed my face into the wall hard enough. Bang! Okay. What actually happened there? What actually took place? You think, what an asshole. Why would he do that? What a b violent brute, etc. Well, when I sobered up the next day, I was aware of how stupid what I had done was. It wasn't that I'd done anything wrong, but I had really done it in the wrong context. Um, wasn't very smart, considering who I knew I was around. And um, I'm not saying that getting my face smashed into a brick wall was a good thing, or that I deserved it. But under the circumstances, what I was doing was, I was saying, I'm one of you, but I don't think of myself as a victim. I have nothing against the English, nothing against the Brits, and don't try and sell me that stuff. That's what I was saying, and not only that, I'm kind of disgusted with the whole idea of Republican violence as well. Um, and some people, that's fundamental to what they are. It's just so deeply ingrained in their thinking that anyone who says anything to the contrary you bastard! I have questioned this person's sense of victimhood. When I say victim, this is what I'm referring to. Not somebody who has had something that's beyond their control visited upon them. Not somebody who has um, experienced, say, tangible um, crimes or violations or whatever to their person who's actually experienced these things. I'm talking about somebody who, in an almost metaphysical or ontological sense, sees themselves as a victim. Now, that, to me, is a form of deliberate slavery. 
um, de deliberate self enslavement or perhaps not deliberate, but it happens to you and you don't realize that it's happening. Um, you feel like you're fundamentally hard done by, you're fundamentally damaged, you're fundamentally disabled by your circumstances and it's not your fault it's somebody else's fault your bad behavior is now somebody else's fault um, his assault of me was my fault because I was impugning his sense of victimhood I was saying that your sense of who you are is all garbage you're, you're nobody you're not a victim you're, 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 you're just some guy getting drunk in a bar who has decided that he's going to get a hate on for the Brits. Um, and, you know, again, I, you know, I can't remember it all that well, but I'm quite sure that I was, you know, quite disgusted with the idea. Um, you know, I guess in his view, I was something akin to an Uncle Tom, right? Um, and he truly hated me enough to visit violence upon me. Now, I'm a big enough guy, he saw fit to attack me where, where when I couldn't do anything, which was a, which kind of is a very, you, you violated some rules of the Irish cult of manhood here when you do that. You're supposed to fling me around, let me button up my fly, and then we'll go. <laughs> um, but, you know, that never happened. Maybe he was drunk. But in any case, what I had done was I had impugned his sense of victimhood. I had harmed him by not allowing him to sort of say that his harm of other people's other people is somehow justified. His hatred of others is somehow justified. Um, victims often cling to their hatreds, and they say that my hate is the other person's fault. My bad behavior is someone else's fault because I'm a victim. Um, that's what disgusts me. People that won't take account... I won't accept accountability for their own actions because I'm a depressed, disadvantaged individual. Uh, therefore, my own behavior really isn't something I can be held to account for. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Make that case all you want for your own life. Leave me the hell out of that kind of calculus. I'm not interested. I'm responsible for what I do. Period. <laughs> um... I won't accept the responsibility for stuff that I haven't done, period. <laughs> you know, if other people who look like me are of my gender and my socioeconomic position and all that sort of thing do all kinds of stuff, well, they did it. I didn't. Nor will I accept, like, because my ancestors an immigrated to Canada during the Great Famine, uh, the late 1840s and early 1850s, where half the population of Ireland either died or had to emigrate. Okay, that happened to them. It didn't happen to me. Um, you know, that's one of the insanities I find of, of nationalism. The nationalist is, has got a sense of grievance over things that he never experienced. Um, why should I be angry about things that didn't happen to me? Or why should I blame the descendants of somebody for something that happened to my ancestors? What? What is this? This is, in, in, in my estimation of things, that's, it's, a, it's a, a species of racism. I'm holding something against somebody, not because of what they've done, but because of what they are. Um, that's racism, isn't it? Okay. And if you have a sense of victimhood, you, oftentimes you can't see that. You can't see that your hatred of Group X, or resentment of these people, or otherwise negative thoughts about them is essentially a form of racism. Um, well, I, yes, of course I have negative feelings about those other people over there, but look what they did to people like me. Of course I'm going to dislike them. I'm a victim. I'm allowed to do that. You see how it works? You see where, where we go with this? Um, the person who is the biggest victim oftentimes is given certain allowances to sort of do things that other people can't do. Um, is some is an African-American who hates white people uh, somehow a better person than a white person who hates African-Americans? Or is there a difference there? And if there is a difference, what's, what is it based on? It's based on the idea of a victim-perpetrator dynamic.
This is what I mean when I say victimhood. And again, there are two ways to look at it. You can look at it logically and say that, you know, you're, con you're contradicting yourself here. You're saying racism is bad, but, you know, anti-group X racism is understandable, at least because of the history behind it. Ah, so racism isn't bad. It's just it has to be a certain type of racism, and then it's acceptable, or sexism, or whatever. Um, if you have oppressed me in the past, then if I hate you, that's less bigoted than if I um, am not a uh, victimized group and I still hate other groups who are not members of my group. That's, that's not acceptable. Um, victim-based racism or victim-based um, bigotry is different than any other kind. Then, I, as I say, there's the internal kind, and I believe that that rots your soul out. You don't work on your own problems. You don't work on your own issues. You don't work on anything that you've done, or anything, I shouldn't say done, but any of the um, flaws or vices that you may have in your, your character. Uh, because those vices are not your fault. They're somebody else's fault. Um... If you have somebody to blame things on, you don't need to solve things. You don't need to work on your own problems. Um, that that was the thinking behind Nazism, right? Well, we're not bad people. We don't. We, we haven't. We have never done anything wrong. It's just uh, horrible things have happened to us. Uh, it's, it's unarguable. Look at what has happened to us. Well, you lost the war. <laughs> That's all. Um, doesn't make you a victim. There's a thing called the. September program of 1914, I think, and it you know, was based on Imperial Germany's war aims and what they were going to do if they'd won the First World War. Well, they were planning on enslaving everybody as well. In fact, their aims, their war aims and their plans, had they won the war, were a lot more harsh and uh, nasty towards countries like France or Russia than they experienced themselves after the First World War. But let's forget about that because we want to be victims. So we want to rail against the injustices of the Treaty of Versailles. Never mind what we plan to do if we'd won the First World War. That's not that, that's irrelevant now. It's what's actually happening now that matters. We lost the war, we're at their mercy, they get to visit their revenge upon us. We are victims. From start to finish, we are victims, so everything we do from here on in flows from that. That is what a fundamental sense of victimhood does to one's character. This is why it disgusts me. A sense of victimhood that is fundamental to what you are and how you see yourself and how you see the world, how you see others, is pathological. It is a block, a barrier to self improvement, I guess I would call it, to uh, growth, to life, to vitality. Um, you don't take the necessary steps to fix yourself, to better yourself, to remedy yourself, to make yourself healthy, because all of your problems can be blamed on a scapegoat. Uh, yes, the victim mentality is scapegoating of the highest order. My bad behavior is not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. That is a sick, sick, sick way of thinking. And I don't mean that in terms of if I see somebody else who thinks that way, I, I think that person is sick. I find that when thoughts like that get into my head, I become sick. Um, it really makes me psychologically, emotionally, and mentally unhealthy. It makes me um, resent the world. It makes me feel very bad about things. Uh, it makes me not want to do anything. It makes me want to sort of barricade myself in my house and tell the rest of the world to go to hell. Because all you people are just out to get me. Um... That's a victim mentality. Uh, and it leads to misanthropy, uh, hatred, racism, all this sort of thing. And it
creeps in in the guise of, yes, you're right, you are a victim. Remember that. Um, or it just turns you into a living corpse. Remember that scene in The Lord of the Rings where Grima Wormtongue is feeding uh, King Theoden's sense of besiege, besieged victimhood. You have so many problems. You have so many things on your plate, so many burdens to bear. Um, you can never get out of this terrible hole you're in, this rut, this state of, you're so stricken by everything. Yeah, just give up. Wormtongue was feeding Theoden's sense of victimhood, and Wormtongue was essentially castrating and killing Theoden with that thinking. Um, this is why I reject that mentality fundamentally. Um, what a lot of people call victimhood or oppression, I call necessity. Never mind the moral angle to it. What are you going to do to fix it? Because it's your life that you're living. Never mind that, you know, what, what you want to project out onto the world. How do you want to live yourself in the world? Do you want to go through life as a victim? No, thank you. But then again, people say, well, it's not my fault that I'm the victim. I'm, I'm reacting, you know, it just keeps going like that. Um, it's a very hard, uh, tough nut to crack, the, a sense of victimhood. And you think you're over it, but you're not necessarily. Every time you think you're on the receiving end of an injustice, you're thinking like a victim. And then you want to hit back. You want to, and you want to, you know, sort of say my bad behavior, my revenge is a result of someone else's uh, aggression against me. This is what I mean by victim, but this has turned into a bit of a rant and a ramble, but the point is made, I think. When, it, when I say victimhood, I mean it in a specific sense. I mean it in a fundamental, um, as a fundamental aspect, as a fundamental part of the bedrock upon which your entire character has grown. That's what I mean by victimhood. 